Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, once again, good to have everybody back, and this is our fourth program this afternoon, and for those of you out in television, again, we're just an informal Bible study, that's why we have the coffee cups, and uh, this is not a Zudo church or anything like that. We're just here to search the scriptures and uh, to see if these things are really so. And again, we always like to thank our television audience for your tremendous response, how we appreciate your help and your letters. Now, we're especially favored today, and uh, I mentioned it in one of the other programs, but our youngest son, Todd, and his wife, Kim, are here, and with our latest grandson, and he's only eight weeks old, so uh, somebody just reminded me today, this is probably his first real Bible study. I'm sure they've already had him in church someplace, but this is his first Bible study. And if the Lord tarries, someday he can look at the tape and he says, there I was, I got a good start. So anyway, we appreciate Todd and Kim and their ability to be here with us today. There he is, my goodness, I didn't even see that. Uh, I'm not just a proud girl. That's a pretty baby. Uh, <laughs> okay, now then, back to the things at hand. Isaiah 65, verse 1. And this is the Lord's answer now to the prayerful plea of the remnant just before he returns. I am sought of them that asked not for me. I am found of them that sought me not. I said, Behold me, behold me unto a nation that was not called by my name. I have spread out my hands all the day unto what kind of people? Rebellious. Now this is Israel. This is Israel. They've had the word. They've had the prophets. They've had the temple. They've had the priesthood. Didn't make any difference. They were just as rebellious and unbelieving as the Gentile, pagan world around them. All right, verse 2, reading on. I have spread out my hands all the day unto a rebellious people who walketh in a way that was not good after their own thoughts. Now, lest you think that this is recent in Israel's history, go back with me to the last verse of Judges. The little book of Judges, chapter 21. And we'll drop in at verse 25. Now, this is about shortly after they came out of Egypt. About 400 years before King David. Joshua, chapter 21, verse 25. Now, this is unbelievable. Did I say Judges? Oh, I said Joshua. I'm sorry, Judges. I was thinking of Joshua's leadership, but no, Joshua's long dead. And uh, the judges have been ruling Israel. Samuel, of course, was the last of the judges. But this last verse just typifies ancient Israel almost from day one. And, of course, Isaiah is now writing almost a thousand years later, and he's deploring the same fact. Judges, chapter 21, verse 25. In those days... There was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Now, beloved, when you let the human race do their own thing, is it good or bad? <laughs> it's not good. It's not good. Okay, back to Isaiah, because I want you to see that God has mercifully put up with the human race from day one. Because Israel was, you know, the covenant people. They should have been a people of obedience, but they weren't. Only the small remnant, see? All right, reading on. <clears throat> Isaiah 65, verse 3. A people that provoketh me to anger continually to my face, that sacrificeth in gardens and burneth incense upon altars of brick, now, what are they doing? Idol worship. And they didn't even build altars the way God instructed them to build altars because when Israel was taught how to build an altar, they didn't use brick, they used what? Hewn stone. 
Not bricks. See, bricks are man-made. They're, they're cooked in an oven. But see, here they use altars made of a counterfeit rather than the hewn stone as God had instructed Israel. All right, so it just all shows rebelliousness. They're not even going to build an altar according to God's design. Verse 4, which remain among the graves and lodge in the monuments who eat swine's flesh. Now, you know, that was forbidden all the way up in Israel's history. And they've eaten swine's flesh and broth of abominable things is in their vessels. In other words, even the soup that they made was made of stuff that was totally contrary to Israel's dietary laws. Verse 5, who say, Stand by thyself, come not near to me, for I am holier than thou. My goodness, <laughs> that puts it as plain as English can make it. So what are they likened to? The Pharisees, that was their attitude. They were righteous, they were holy. They would wrap their clerical robes around themselves and they could do no wrong. But these were the same way, see? And they say, I'm holier than you are. These are a smoke in my nose, not the smoke of incense as God appreciated in the temple worship, but this was acrid smoke that burned the nostrils. Thou art a smoke in my nose, a fire that burneth all the day. Now again, I think you can go back to an analogy of the ancients. They probably uh, lived in small dwellings. They didn't have central heat and air. So what was the normal material for burning to keep the house warm? Well, dried uh, cow manure, just like uh, they did out west. And so that acrid smoke of that cattle refuge would literally permeate the whole house. And that's what they lived in. But God likens that to his experience with Israel. See? Verse 6. Behold, it is written before me, I will not keep silence. I will recompense, even recompense into their bosom. Verse 7, your iniquities and the iniquities of your fathers together, saith the Lord, who have burned incense upon the mountains and blasphemy upon the hills. Therefore, I will measure their former work into their bosom. In other words, it's been generation after generation. Now, verse 8. This is an interesting little verse. Thus saith the Lord, as the new wine is found in the cluster, and one saith, Destroy it not. Now you've got to kind of put some thoughts here. What kind of a grapevine do you suppose the hired help were pulling out to burn? Well, the ones that weren't producing. The dead ones. That stands to reason. But as they're about to pull out this dead grapevine, the husband sees what? One cluster of grapes. And what does he say? Don't destroy that good little cluster of grapes. Now read on. Destroy it not, for a blessing is in it, so I will do for my servant's sake that I may not destroy them all. Again, what's that one little clump of grapes and the dead vine a picture of? The remnant. The remnant, see? Oh, all these things you've got to kind of dig, and then here they come, and oh, it just, just tantalizes your spiritual appetite. Oh, don't destroy the vine. There is one cluster of grapes that is still... Uh, useful for the grape juice. Now verse 9. I will bring forth a seed out of Jacob and out of Judah, an inheritor of my mountains and my, what? Elect. See? The remnant again. The true believer. And my elect shall inherit it, and my servants shall dwell there. Now we come to the promises of this coming kingdom. Verse 10. And Sharon, that is the valley of Sharon, which is just east of the Mediterranean coast. It's one of the valleys of Israel. And now, of course, a lot of it is covered with the sand that is blown up from the Mediterranean Sea. And I don't know how much uh, validity is this, but one of our guides told us over there how all that sand accumulates upon Israel. It comes from the Nile water coming into the Mediterranean and then all the prevailing northwesterly winds blow it up 
on the shore of Israel. And so you got these huge sand dunes all along the Mediterranean seashore. But beyond them, of course, you have this productive valley of Sharon, and uh, it will be a fold of flocks. In other words, Sharon is going to uh, revert back to that beautiful, productive valley of grass and water for the flocks of Israel. And the valley of Achor. Now, those of you who know your Old Testament, what was the valley of Achor? Well, you remember when um, Achan, shortly after they came across the Jordan River, and they were to have nothing to do with the spoils of the little town of Ai. And they were instructed, don't touch any of that stuff. It should all be destroyed. What did Achan do? He took some for himself. And he thought he'd gotten away with it. But God knew. And you remember that Achan was dealt harshly over that? And the valley of Achor became a curse to Israel. It was just something that was avoided. But here in the kingdom, it's going to be a valley of blessing. And so the valley of Achor, a place for the herds to lie down, for my people that have sought me. In other words, again, for the remnant that's going to come into this glorious earthly kingdom that's been promised since day one. Now, verse 11. But you are they that forsake the Lord, that forget my holy mountain, that prepare a table for that troop, and that furnish the drink offering unto that number. Therefore, I will number you. Now that's the unbelieving element again. I will number you to the sword, and you shall all fall down to the slaughter. Remember what Zechariah said? Two-thirds will die. One-third will come through the tribulation and be the remnant to go into the kingdom. Verse 13, Therefore thus saith the Lord, Behold, my servant shall eat, but you shall be hungry. Behold, my servant shall drink, but you shall be thirsty, and so on and so forth. Verse 14, my servants, that is the believing remnant, my servants shall sing for joy of heart, but you shall cry for sorrow of heart, and shall howl for vexation of spirit. And you shall leave your name for a curse unto my chosen, for the Lord God shall what? Slay thee. Now, you see, I mentioned the two women at the well and two people sleeping in the bed. And what does the Lord say in Matthew? The one shall be taken, the other left. Well, which one will be taken? The unbeliever. He'll be removed, and the believer will go on into the kingdom economy. All right, now then, let's drop quickly down to verse 17. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former, that is the old earth, shall not be remembered nor come to mind. Now, of course, I guess there's room for controversy here. Is he speaking of the new heaven and new earth of Revelation 21 and 22? Or is he speaking of the renovated earth of the kingdom age? I personally feel he's talking about the renovated earth for the millennial reign. Now, you've got to remember, the thousand-year reign of Christ is the kingdom economy, which Christ will rule and reign from Jerusalem. And then at the end of that thousand years, you see, according to Revelation, now, of course, the Old Testament prophets knew nothing of that. But after the end of the millennium, now let's go back to Revelation and take a look at that. If we'll try to take time for it. And you come back to Revelation. And here we find that after the thousand years are over, Revelation 20, Verse 7. Revelation 20, verse 7. Revelation 20, verse 7. Now remember, it's going to be heaven on earth because Satan has been locked up. There has been no one to tempt him. They've had perfect environment. They've not been tempted to sin or to rebel until he's released. And then for a little while, he's going to again confuse the multitudes. All right, verse 7 of Revelation 20. And when the thousand years are expired, that's the kingdom, the millennium, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. He'll go out to deceive the nations who are in the four corners of the earth, Gog, Magog, all of them, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is of the sand of the sea, 
and they went up on the breadth of the earth. I mean, it's just a repetition of Armageddon all over again. And they come past the camp of the saints about, the beloved city, which of course is Jerusalem. But this time God wastes no time. Fire comes down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Satan, of course, is consigned to the lake of fire. Then you go through the great white throne, preparing everything for the coming eternal bliss of both Israel and the Gentile world. Now you come into chapter 21. And now John prophetically sees a new heaven and a new earth. And I don't think it's the new heaven and new earth that Isaiah is referring to. He's referring to the thousand year earth which will be renovated. But this will be brand new. I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were what? Passed away. And Peter puts it in scientific language and he says that the earth and everything in it is burned up and it's going to be dissolved. It's going to be melted down. And out of that will then come the eternal new heaven and a new earth. And again, it just seems that God's going to still maintain that separation between Israel and the church who are the heavenly, even for all of eternity. But whatever. Back to Isaiah quickly now. We only got about half the program left already. So here we're preparing the earth for the millennial reign, heaven on earth. And it's going to be an earth of tremendous production. There will be no want. There will be no sweat of the face. It's going to be an easy production. And food will be in abundance everywhere. All right, verse 19, Isaiah 65. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and join joy in my people. The voice of weeping shall be no more heard in her, nor the voice of crying. There shall be no more thence an infant of days, nor an old man that hath not filled his days. In other words, death will be almost unknown in this thousand year period. For a child shall die a hundred years old. In other words, at a hundred, they're still just as vibrant as a child. But the sinner being a hundred shall be accursed, which means there might be a possibility of someone having to be removed. I think it's going to be so rare that the scripture really doesn't deal with it all that much. All right, now verse 21. It's going to be a, a kingdom of tremendous activity. And they shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. They shall not build and another inhabit, which was Israel's history. They'd get their economy going and Enemy forces would come in and take their crops and destroy their houses, and they were under constant turmoil. But that will happen no more. Verse 22, reading on, For as the days of a tree are the days of my people, and my elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. In other words, I think they'll live the whole thousand-year period of time, even as they did back before the flood. Verse 23, they shall not labor in vain nor bring forth for trouble, for they are the seed of the blessed of the Lord and their offspring with them. Now verse 24. Now this is a perfect parallel with John's gospel, chapter 14. And it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are yet speaking, I will hear. I think I've got time. Let's go up to John's Gospel because this has been such a confusing thing for so many people and they can't get it through their thinking that Christ was looking forward to the kingdom time when he said so many of these things. They're not apropos for us today. You know it as well as I know it. John 14. Verse 13. Now, this will all become a reality in this kingdom economy. When Christ is ruling and Satan is locked up and every, every Jew will be in a special manifestation of God's grace and power. Verse 13, the Lord is speaking and he says, Whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. What does that mean? Whatever they want. All they have to do is speak it. 
providing, of course, it's within common sense, and I think that's going to be a given. But it's going to be the time when all their prayers will be answered as if they had merely had the thought. Okay, back to Isaiah quickly now for the last verse in chapter 65. And this is a perfect parallel for Isaiah chapter 11. <clears throat> verse 25. Isaiah 65. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together. Now this isn't just pie in the sky. A lot of people poof at this. And they say, well, that's just a figure of speech. No, it is not. This is going to become a literal reality when God will literally change the digestive system of the wild animals where they will not eat of other living things. <clears throat> Isaiah 11 says that they will eat of everything that grows naturally, the herbs and the grasses and so forth. All right, the wolf and the lamb shall feed together and the lion shall eat straw like a bullock. His whole digestive system will be transferred from carnivorous to eating forage. And thus shall be the serpent's food. Now, we know that the serpent will not be active in the kingdom. So this, of course, is simply a play on words that the serpent will not enjoy all these good things of the kingdom. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain or in my kingdom, saith the Lord. All right, now let's go into the final chapter of Isaiah. And remember that Isaiah is 66 chapters long, and our Bible is 66 books. So there is a parallel. Verse 1, Thus saith the Lord, The heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. Now what is that a significance of? His sovereignty. The earth is just his footstool. It's just a little marble out of all of God's creation, and it's His. The earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you build unto me, and where is the place of my rest, and so forth. All right, verse, I'm going to skip now, so we get a little closer to the end. Verse 5, Hear the word of the Lord, ye that tremble at His word, your brethren that hated you. Wow, what do we got there again? The little remnant has been hated by the majority. And we're seeing the same thing today. Even amongst Christendom, even in the realms of Christendom, the true believer is more and more being scorned by the masses. They think we're odd. They, they think we're, we're narrow-minded and uh, they don't literally take this book to be true. My goodness, we just had a lady share with us during break time where she was in a church out near the East Coast, where they gave their Sunday school kids the lesson that they came from apes, evolution. If they wanted to teach creation, they could believe it if they want to. But listen, this is happening in churches. This is apostasy. And it's coming in like a flood. That's one of the worst ones I've heard. But I've heard a lot of them almost as bad. But beloved, it's always been this way. Even in ancient Israel, the true believer was scorned and ridiculed by the majority. All right, read on. Verse 5 again. Hear the word of the Lord, ye that tremble at his word, your brethren that hated you, that cast you out for my name's sake, said, Let the Lord be glorified, but he shall appear to your joy, and they shall be what? Ashamed, disappointed. Now, that reminds me of a verse in Peter. I think I can take the time. Go all the way up to 1 Peter. Makes the same analogy. And this is New Testament. 1 Peter 2, verse 6. 1 Peter 2, verse 6. First Peter verse 6. Wherefore, Peter writes, also it is contained in the scripture, behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, Jesus of Nazareth, the Messiah, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be 
confound it, and if you want to take your concordance or strongs and you compare that word, what's another word for it? Disappointed. Disappointed. Now, when will the mass of so-called religious people be disappointed? When they find themselves in the wrong place. That's the same way with church people today. My, when they slip out into eternity, they're going to be disappointed. They're not going to be where they thought they were going. Okay, we're down to two minutes. Let's move on up into chapter 66. Verse 7. Verse 7. Before she travailed, she brought forth. Before her pain came, she was delivered of a man-child. Who are we talking about? Israel. And what's the man-child? Christ's birth at Bethlehem. See? Now verse 8. Who hath heard such a thing? Who hath seen such things? Shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day? Or shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as tra Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. Now we're jumping up from the miracle of Bethlehem to the super, super miracle of the second coming and Christ establishing his kingdom and the saved of Israel entering into all the promises that they've been looking for. And how long is it going to take to happen? In an instant. The moment Christ returns, they're going to come in to the glory of that promised kingdom. All right, let's read on for the minute we have left. Verse 9, Shall I bring to the birth and not cause to bring forth, saith the Lord? Shall I cause to bring forth and shut the womb? Oh, no way. God isn't going to fall short of all these promises. Rejoice with Jerusalem and be glad with her. All ye that love her rejoice for joy with her. Then drop all the way down to verse 15. I'm going to do this quickly. For behold, the Lord will come with fire and with his chariots like a whirlwind to render his anger and fury and his rebuke with flames of fire and so on and so forth. But verse 17, for those who are believers, they that sanctify themselves and purify themselves in the gardens behind one tree in the midst, eating swine's flesh and so forth, Verse 18, for I know their works and their thoughts. It shall come that I will gather all nations and tongues, and they shall come and see my glory. When will that happen? At his second coming. And we're getting closer and closer every day. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Veldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Felding.